Hello everybody, in today's video what I want to show you is how to get started setting up your own local development environment to program with Go. Now I know in the last video I showed you this website here and I said that this is what I want to use that is the website at play.golang.org and I said that this is the website that I want to use in order to show you a lot of the concepts that you're going to need to be familiar with with the Go language. And that's still my plan but as I thought about it I decided that it doesn't really make sense to force you to use the playground just because it's a really good place for me to demonstrate concepts. So I want you to have all the tools available to you to set up your own local Go development environment so you can play around with creating your own applications as you learn about this wonderful language. So the first thing that we're going to need to do is we're going to need to download and install the Go language and the Go tools itself. And so in order to get started with that we're going to start over here at golang.org and we're going to click on this download Go link here. Now this link is going to take you to all sorts of different versions of Go. Now right now version 1.7.5 just got released and it's the official version of Go. But if you come down here to the bottom, Go version 1.8 is at release candidate 3. And I expect that that's going to be released to full production status pretty soon. So we can also install that. But in general, if you're getting started, just pick the latest stable version that's available for you and it's not going to steer you wrong. Now if you're a Windows user, then I would encourage you to click this MSI link. It's going to download an installer and Go is going to be put on your system automatically. However, if you're using OS X or Linux, then I would recommend that you go to this installation instructions link here and follow the instructions here. Now you're still going to need to download the Go binaries. But if you scroll down just a little bit, you're going to see this command here. And this is going to give you the tar command that you're going to need to use in order to unpack the Go binary and install it onto your system. So I've already done that, and I can show you that by opening up a terminal here. And the default location to put Go is in the user directory, underneath local, and then in a folder called Go. So if we look at there, and I look at the contents there, I see that I have all the Go tools installed. So with the Windows installer, all it's going to do is it's going to place these into C colon backslash go. And I would strongly encourage you, if you can accept these default locations, that you go ahead and do that. Because it's going to make setting up your environment just a little bit simpler. Now after we get Go installed, we have a little bit of configuration in our environment in order to be able to use Go effectively. So I'm going to come back to my home directory here, and I'm going to make a change to my bash rc file. Now I'm on Ubuntu so it's going to be in my bash rc file. If you're in OS 10 it's going to be your bash profile. If you're in Windows basically what we're doing is we're setting environment variables. So if I open that up and come down to the bottom then I see that I've got the pre-generated bash script. I'm not going to really worry about that. But there's a couple of variables that we're going to need to set. Hello everybody. I need to pause the video here for a second and make an important announcement. So as soon as I originally released this video, Dave Cheney came in within a couple of minutes and he expressed a concern about one of the things that I'm about to talk about. Now I'm about to talk about setting a couple of environment variables here and showing you how they work. Now one of those variables is called go root. And setting go root has been shown to cause problems as you move through different versions of go, especially if you've got multiple versions of the language on your system. So if you want more information about that, Dave has a really good blog post here that you can go to to learn more information about it. But for now, please keep in mind, if you're able to install Go at its default locations, which on Unix or Mac is going to be slash user slash local slash Go, and on Windows is going to be C colon backslash Go. If you're able to do that, please do that and then go ahead and avoid setting Go root. Now you will need to set the path variable to go root's bin directory in order to access the go executable and you will need to set go path which we're going to talk about after that. But if you can avoid setting the go root environment variable it's going to save you a lot of heartache. So while I'm going to show you how to do that in case you do need to set it please avoid that if at all possible. Okay at this point I'm going to resume the video and continue talking about the environment setup. Now the first variable that you're going to need to know about is called go root. Now if you've installed Go to its default location, you're not going to need to worry about this. But if you've decided to install Go somewhere else, for example, maybe you've installed it in your home directory, then you can go ahead and set Go root, and that'll tell the environment where to go to find the Go binaries. Now the next thing that we want to do is we actually want to set a path variable to the Go binaries themselves. So I'm going to go ahead and export a path variable, and that'll of course start with my existing path, and then I'm going to add on to that Go root, and then I'm going to whack on the path slash bin. So there's quite a few binaries that you're going to be using on a regular basis, and those are in go root slash bin. So you're going to want to make sure that that's part of your path. Now once I do that, let me go ahead and save this. 
and then I will use the source command in order to get my shell to reread the batch RC file. And then I should be able to test to make sure Go is available by typing Go and version. And you can see here I'm running Go version 1.8, release candidate 3. Okay, now there's one more thing that we need to do in order to get our environment fully set up. And I'm going to go back into my bash RC file in order to do that. And that is the setting of a second environment variable. So we have go root, and that's going to tell the environment where Go is installed. But we're also going to be downloading a lot of packages as we work with Go because we're going to be taking advantage of libraries that other people have published in order to build our own applications out. So those applications, as well as our own source code, are not going to be located with the Go binaries. They're going to be located in a path that we're going to specify with another variable called GoPath. Now GoPath is either one of the most awesome or one of the most horrible things about Go, because it gives you this really nice way to specify where your Go projects are located. However, it does kind of push you towards having this monolithic repository of all these binaries and your applications tied together. So I'll show you a little bit of a hint on how to work with that. But for now, let's go ahead and set a GoPath variable in my home directory, and then I will call this GoLib. Now, just like with GoRoot, we might have some executable binaries that are going to be stored in our GoPath. So I'm going to go ahead and export on our path again, and we'll start with our existing path, and then I want to add on GoPath slash bin. That way, if we install any libraries that have executables, and we will be installing libraries that have executables, then we're going to be able to track that. Now, just to show you real quick what that's going to do, let me go ahead and save this out, resource my bash RC file, and then I've actually already created this folder here called golib. Now, if I go into golib and I look at the contents of that, it's currently empty. But I can change that by using a tool called go get. So if I get a library that's at github.com slash nsf slash go code, this is historically the library that people use to provide autocomplete functionality in their Go applications. So if I go ahead and hit enter and wait a second, then go back into my GoLib folder and look, now I've got some contents here. So if I look in the bin directory, I've got this Go code executable. And if I come back to the source directory, then I see that I've got this github.com folder. And inside of that is NSF. And inside of that is Go code. So if I come in here, here's all of the source code for the Go code library. So when I'm working with Go code, it actually downloads the source code and compiles it into the Go code library for me. And that's what that Go path is going to do for you. The problem that you might run into is that this use of Go path tends to drive towards monolithic repositories. So you're going to have Go code, you're going to have your own code, you're going to have all sorts of other libraries all put into this one location. Now, when I create my courses, that creates a lot of visual clutter. And so that isn't exactly the form of GoPath that I use. What I do is coming back into my bash RC file is I actually use a capability of GoPath to create a compound GoPath. So instead of a single path here, I'm actually going to re-export GoPath and I'm going to add on an additional path to this. And I'm going to add home, mic, and code. Now, a lot of times when I'm teaching courses, I only need two Go paths. And so I've got GoLib, and that's going to be where all my third party libraries go. And then I'm going to have another folder that's going to be what's called my workspace location. So let's go ahead and write this out. We'll source this again. And now I've got the full Go path. So if I come into my GoLib and I remove everything from it, now it's empty again. So if I go ahead and go get that repository again at github.com slash NSF slash Go code. And now you see that it actually goes into my GoLib folder. If I come into my code folder, which I also created earlier, that's still empty. So the first segment of your Go path is going to be used by GoGet in order to store your files, but all of the segments of your Go path are going to be searched for source code. So that's going to really help us as we're setting up our workspace. So speaking of which, that's the next thing that I want to do. So a workspace in Go isn't anything special. The only thing that you need in order to create a workspace is to have a single directory called SRC in it. So if I add a directory called SRC into my code folder, then I've got a Go workspace. Now SRC, as you might expect, is where you're going to keep your source code. So when I set Go path to slash home slash mic slash code, it's going to look for an SRC directory in order to find my source code. Now there are two other directories that you might find in a workspace that are interesting. Now we found one already when we installed that Go code library, and that's bin. 
So anytime we're working with a project and a binary is created, it's going to be put into that bin directory. And that's also why we added that bin segment to our path. The last directory that you might find in your workspace is a PKG directory. So if we're compiling something and it's going to generate an intermediate binary, which means it's not going to be a fully compiled application, it's going to be an intermediate step. So for example, if we're taking a third party library and we're integrating that into our application, then the PKG directory is where those intermediate binaries are going to be stored. And the reason those are created is so that they don't have to be recompiled every time. So when you compile your Go application, Go is going to check to see if any of the source files in that directory have changed since the last time it compiled them. If it hasn't, then it's not going to recompile that package. It's just going to go ahead and link them into the binary that it's creating for you. Okay, so let's go ahead and clear this out because that's getting a little bit cluttered. And now let's set up an editor to work with Go code. Now there's a lot of editors that are out there. And so what I'm going to show you is just one, but feel free to explore the options for your favorite editor because there's probably a Go plugin for it. And all of these plugins are really good right now. So I'm going to show you the one that I've been using lately, which is Visual Studio Code. Now it might be a little bit surprising, Microsoft, oh my goodness, they're doing all this really awesome stuff for the open source community, but it's really true. One of the best development experiences that you're likely to come across with Go is in this Microsoft product running on Linux. So I've already installed it, but if you do need to install it, you can come here to code.visualstudio.com. It's going to give you the binaries. In this case, I'm running Ubuntu, so I would download this .deb file and install that onto my system. And then I'm going to be able to run that by simply typing code in my application launcher, or I've already set up a shortcut over here in my taskbar. So as soon as I run that, I'm going to be presented with this. Now you can see I've already opened up a folder here. You can open up a folder to your workspace by simply file open and then pick your folder that you want to be working with. So we're going to be working with code. But there is one setup step that I need to go through before Visual Studio Code is quite ready to go. And that is I need to install the plugin that's going to allow it to work with Go code. So if I click this button down here called extensions, then I have a list of all sorts of extensions that I could add in for Visual Studio Code. Now right here is the Go extension by Luke Hoban. Now there's a couple of Go extensions, but I would strongly recommend you use this one here by Luke because it is really amazing. It offers a lot of capability and really makes Visual Studio Code a first class environment for developing Go. Okay, and as fast as that, that's been installed and it was that fast because it's been cached from earlier. And then I'm all set and ready to build my first Go application. So let me go ahead into this source directory and I'm gonna create a folder that's gonna contain my source code. Now your first temptation might be to just plug in your source code right here in your SRC folder, but I wouldn't recommend that. The standard structure that you're going to use in a Go application is to mirror where your application is going to be in source control, and that makes it Go gettable. So in this case, if I was going to keep this file in GitHub, I would create a folder called github.com, and then underneath that, my GitHub account is V-A-N-S-I-M-K-E. Don't ask, long story about why I called it that. And then I would have an application name. So I would call this maybe first app. And that's the folder that I'm going to store my application in. And the reason for that is if you think about if I check this into GitHub in a repository called first app, when I go get that, it's going to recreate this structure. And so you want to create your applications following that structure. So now I'm ready to create my first file and I will call that main.go. And then I can start adding in my source code. So the first thing that I'm going to add is package main. And then when I save this, oh, it looks like I expected something to happen here and it's not happening. I think it's because, yeah, it told me that I needed to reload the environment. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So I'm going to exit out of Visual Studio Code and it should kick right back off, but it has to initialize the plugin. So now I see what I was expecting to see. And that is that the Go plugin has recognized that I don't have all the tools that it needs in order to provide me all the support that it can. Because the Go plugin for Visual Studio Code is actually like a lot of the plugins in other languages, it takes advantage of these language services. For example, it's talking to me about GoLint. GoLint isn't available on my system, and so it's not going to be able to provide linting capabilities. So basically, the Go plugin calls out to all these language services. The nice thing about that is if you decide to flip between different editors, your experience is pretty much the same because they're all relying on these same language services in order to provide you the capabilities that you have. So let me go ahead and install all. And you can see there's a pretty long list of libraries that it's installing for me. Okay, and now they're all installed. So that took about a minute to install all those dependencies. So I expect that you'd probably have a similar experience in your own environment. 
Now, before we start adding anything else, I actually put some quotation marks around this package, so that's not going to be correct. And now I'm ready to start actually building out my program. So let me go ahead and put in an import statement here. And we haven't talked too much about imports, but we have mentioned a little bit about packages. Packages are how code is organized into sub-libraries inside of Go. So for example, if I want to build a web application, then I might pull in the net HTTP package that you see here in order to set up my web request handlers. But for now, I just want to do a simple hello Go example, and so I'm just going to import the FMT package. But you notice that the Go plugin for Visual Studio Code gives me autocomplete. So any library that's available on my Go path is going to be found here. So now I'm going to create a simple function called main, and inside of that I'm going to access the FMT package, and notice that I get autocomplete functionality here. So I can go ahead and say I want to call the println function, and it gives me the signature for that function. So I can go ahead and add that in here, and then I just want to say hello go. Okay. So in order to run this, inside of Visual Studio Code, you do have the ability by pressing control back tick, you can open up a terminal right here inside of the editor. And there's a couple of different options that I have in order to run my application. So the first thing that I can do is I can use Go's run command, as you see here, and I can give it the path all the way through to my source code. So if I come and I just keep tabbing through, then I'm going to get source slash github.com slash v-a-n-s-i-m-k-e slash first app slash main.go. So if I run that, then it'll compile that temporarily and run that for me. And it'll also compile in any third-party libraries. So the FMT package was compiled in as well. Now that's a really good way to get a really quick run. Another way that you have available to you is to use go build. And go build takes the actual package path. So all we're going to do here is compile the first app package. Now, if it finds a main package with a main function, then it's going to compile that as an executable, like you see right here in my home directory. So I can go ahead and run that. Now, the last build tool that I have available is go install. Go install is actually expecting to be pointed to a package that has an entry point, and it's going to install that into your bin folder. So let's go ahead and see that work. So we'll go to github.com my username for GitHub, and then first app again. So notice I'm using the package address. I'm not using the folder path. If I run that, notice I don't get anything in my main directory, but if I come into this bin folder here, now I've got first app over here. So if I come back to my terminal, bin slash first app, run that, I get hello go printed out again. Okay, so the last thing that I want to show you, if I come back over to the terminal, so you see how we have all the packages that we're working with locally over here in this code directory. If I come to the first element of my Go path, which is golib, and look at that, you'll see that this has started to become a pretty busy place here because now I've got three source folders. And if I come into github.com, you'll see that I've got quite a few packages. So now all of these third-party dependencies aren't cluttering up my main workspace. They're all in this golib folder, and then I can focus on my development in my code folder. Now the last place that you're going to see packages is over in the Go installation directory. So if I look in that folder, you see here that I have this directory called source. So the Go source code itself is in fact a valid Go workspace. So if I come in here, look at the folders in here, you see these are exactly the Go standard library. So here's FMT here. You see if I scroll down a little bit, the net package, if I go into the net package, you'll see that that contains the HTTP package. If I come into the HTTP package and list those contents, you see all of the source codes for all of the modules that you can see over here at golang.com. So if I follow that through over here, scroll down to net and HTTP, you see all of the capabilities that are available in here. Well, all of those are provided by this source code here. So if you have any questions about how any one of those libraries work or how th something's configured, you can jump right into the source code and see how it's all put together. Okay, well, I hope that helps you out. Hopefully at this point, you can start playing around with Go source code in your local environments, get some small programs up and running. In the next video, I really do want to get back into the Go language itself, start talking about how we can create variables and constants and things like that. So until then, have a great time exploring Go.